Hello everyone, this is Political Forum for May 22nd, 2013. I'm Steve Nikotopoulos, a staff member here at CAN-TV, and today we're joined by Alderman Scott Wagisback from the 32nd Ward. Thanks for having me tonight, Steve. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, over the next 25 minutes, we're going to be taking calls from the community, so feel free to call in. The number is always on the screen right here, 312-738-1060. Uh, Alderman, can you please uh, let us know a little bit about the 32nd Ward, what part of the city is it located in, and what are some of the, uh, the key highlights? Well, uh, so everybody knows Steve's actually a constituent of mine. I have to start out with that. And uh, he's actually, he lives in Ukrainian Village. So Ukrainian Village is obviously um, one portion of the old ward. Um, as a lot of people out there know, we've been mm -hmm. redistricted. And um, in the new map, I've lost uh, Ukrainian Village, Wicker Park, East Village, and I moved over to Logan Square. But I still have a good portion of um, the neighborhoods like... Uh, a little bit of Lincoln Park, um, Roscoe Village, Bucktown, and uh, then essentially moved a little bit further west to Logan Square. And let me put your info up for everybody. So this actually, this is the old map. Right. And this is the uh, part down here that is the Ukrainian village. So a lot of this is uh, Wicker Park and Bucktown. Right. And then uh, Noble Square. Um, the number, I assume, is still the same, 248-1330. Uh, for your office. That's right. And yeah. then, of course, ward32.org for any of yeah, and we, yeah. we try to put a lot of information on the Ward 32 site, whether it's about schools, um, construction, big projects that we're working on, all the neighborhood organizations and links to other valuable information. So you should probably check it out and just um, learn a lot from just the Ward 32 site. And as your constituent, I could recommend anybody who wants to get on the newsletter, you're always going to get uh, something that kind of lets you know what's happening in the community and what's right. going on in city council from an inside point of view. So it's actually really helpful. Uh, now, just to talk a little bit about the ward mapping, um, here is the difference, just to show you a little bit. Now, this is the old ward, okay, with the black right here. Right. The new ward, now here's Bucktown right here, here's Bucktown over here. So you still have most of Bucktown, but it all it meanders all the way over into Logan Square now. Um, how, how did this ward remap happen? Well, essentially, uh, when you look at the map, um, and you can see different uh, neighborhoods split up there. So um, if you look on the right side of your map there, it says the 2 next to the 32. On the far right of the map, that's Alderman Fioretti. And um, he basically took over a good portion of the 32nd Ward, uh, Walter Burnett. And a lot of what happens here is, uh, is just... Um, it depends on which caucus or which faction is working on the map at a particular moment. But essentially, the Hispanic caucus and the black caucus members of the city council, uh, based on the Voting Rights Act and other issues, kind of carved out what uh, they needed for their portions of the maps. And a lot of the people who are kind of in between the lakefront and then the wards further west um, were left with these pockets that kind of uh, roam around and um, a lot of that's just split up between us. Um, I think the way we, to look at it positively, I mean there's there is a lawsuit out there but um, to positively um, you know take a different angle on it, um, we would represent anybody that we feel um, needs representation. So if somebody calls our office, even if they're in the old part of the ward, we feel obligated to make sure that we help them as well as the people in the new portion of the ward. So you pretty much are doing double time right now. You have yeah. seemingly all of this area plus all of this area. So right. pretty much, what, a third of West Town? It's, <laughs> it's a pretty large area, but, um, you know, I, I enjoy working in both areas, and um, I've learned a lot from people in Ukrainian Village over the years. I'm in Wicker Park. I'm really sad to lose those area because I really feel at home there. Um, but it'll be very interesting to pick up the new parts in Logan Square. No, we're sad to lose you too. Uh, let me go ahead and open up the phones because we have somebody calling in. Hello, caller. What's your question for the show? Yes, good evening. Actually, I have uh, two questions uh, for you, Alderman. Uh, first question, um, concerning the school closing plan, I keep hearing that uh, the reason is that we can't keep uh, the status quo. I'm just having a hard time accepting the fact that closing 50 schools is the answer to that. And so I just want your uh, insight on that. And then also, if you can remember the second question, I know that your ward is filled with uh, a lot of people who, who like to bike around, and especially with the summertime coming up. I just want to know what's your take on the proposed uh, bike rules to maybe possibly uh, start getting some of these bikers uh, in line. Sure. Uh, if we could start out with the bike issues, 
Um, essentially, you know, the, the city's moving forward on a plan uh, that really pushes biking um, uh, and favors biking throughout the city. Uh, there's new pedestrian plans, there's new CTA plans, there's plans to um, put bike lanes in up and down on the spoke routes like Milwaukee. There's bike share programs going in that will be taking up a lot of parking spaces. Uh, I think that's all well and good. Some of it's not well thought out or as well thought out as it should be, but um, the city's moving forward on it. Um, my biggest issue is that along with the movement to increase the amount of bike usage um, throughout the ward, throughout the city, that we see enforcement as well. And every summer we do about six to nine enforcement events, um, and they've actually been more focused on safety, handing out lights, um, talking to people who blow through lights, mostly at uh, Six Corners, um, Damon, Milwaukee, or Damon, Milwaukee and North, and then in Lincoln as well. Um, I'd like to see more tickets written, and we've talked to the commanders about that in different areas. We've talked to the ATA and CDOT and said, look, if we're going to put all this investment into it, there needs to be uh, a, a give and take here and making sure that people follow the rules of the road, uh, not just share them anymore, but follow the rules of the road is important. Mm -hmm. On the CPS closings, uh, Steve and I were just talking about beforehand, and um, we're still gathering information from uh, you know what happened at the board meeting, but I can tell you that uh, many of us were opposed to this such massive closings, um, especially because CPS did not have a plan in place, a master plan for the entire school system. The billion dollar uh, you know, gap that they're talking about is pretty bogus. They come up with that every year and they end up with a, um, a surplus. So the facts just don't, uh, the facts just aren't right that we've been put it, seeing out there. A lot of us were going to the hearings. They didn't listen to what was happening at the hearings. And to take four of them off was a nice little token um, from the mayor, but uh, it it just misses the point about the, the situation here in the city with uh, CPS, that we need more, um, more push for a capital plan, more push for a comprehensive reform of the system, but not more uh, taking a sledgehammer to something that needs a little bit of adjustment. Now, um, yeah, just to follow up to that, I mean, you know what I heard from the uh, the board the board of education meeting today were some outbursts. You know it was an emotional event. Yep. It's been emotional events. Uh, families losing their their neighborhood schools. One of the things the Progressive Caucus talks about is the worry about having school deserts. Can you talk about what is the potential impact of losing? schools in specific neighborhoods. Right. Well, if you look at, um, you know, the 32nd Ward, I should go back a little bit. Prescott School and Hamilton School were on the closure list a few years ago. Um, what CPS did was basically say, we don't know what we're doing with those schools. We haven't really known what we're doing. So let's just throw up our hands, throw up the white flag and give up and say we're going to close those schools. That was unacceptable to me. And we fought back. We made sure that they got the resources they need and the leadership to turn those schools around. CPS is a revolving door of, of leadership. Um, from one day to the next, an alderman might not know who to deal with downtown, and that says a lot about the direction that they've gone. Um, I think the, the, this desert issue um, is going to be critical in places like East Humboldt, where uh, my neighboring alderman, Alderman Moreno, was talking about today losing one of the schools there. Uh, when you have major projects going up, like Lathrop Homes, which is uh, um, on the chopping block for major reconstruction, mm -hmm. And CPS doesn't uh, sit down and talk to you about where those kids going to go if you put in 1,400 units, um, you know, and just kind of wing it. That's just unacceptable, and it just shows that there's a lack of leadership, a lack of thought going into long-term issues here in the city. And as much as I know we need to uh, change things in the schools and get the right funding in, uh, they've just gone about it in the wrong way. Okay. Well, uh, let's go back to the phones real quick here. Hello, caller. What's your question? Hello. What I want to say, I was at the hearing today, and none of the board went in a closed session to vote on these schools. They, it was already made up. Their mind was made up. And my, you know, what makes my comment is to let the alderman know that you can tell your your partners in crime, those other aldermen, especially those black ones, that when election time comes, they can get ready to be on the unemployment line. Well, it's, yeah, an emotional call, but one thing that has to be said is how much how much of a role did the alderman really play in the decision-making process of this? Well, the alderman here didn't, uh, I don't think they factored in as much as maybe they thought some of, or some people thought they did. Um, there are, you know, some aldermen in the city who might have had a little bit more of an effect because they're very tight with the mayor. 
Um, but I think you're right. You know, we'll see what happens two years from now. But it's not just about CPS. I mean, I think there's there's been a lack of regard for policies in general across the city. And I didn't go to the hearing today, but um, I think it was a foregone conclusion that they were going to close those 50. Um, but here's the point. You can, uh, you can continue to go down the path you're going. You can t continue to put these kind of people into an appointed position like this, or you can have an elected school board or something similar to that. You can continue to have the same leadership at the city as we've had for the last couple decades, and I don't think things have changed much except that now government's, uh, you know, on these on privatization steroids, and uh, it's just despicable in a lot of ways. So I think that if people want to see change in this city, you better get out and organize, or you can expect the same thing. And I want to remind everybody, uh, Political Forum is here every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, over the next few months, we specifically are going to be having aldermen in, so feel free to call in. As you can see, we let people call in and ask their questions directly to the guests, so feel free to call in and ask aldermen what their opinion is of the school closings and what uh, what role they played in or against it. Uh, let's go ahead and take another call right now. Hello, caller. What's your question? Yes, good afternoon, alderman. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, my question is, what kind of festivals would you be having around your area for festivals. families? For, uh, well, actually, we have about 30-plus um, festivals or events in the ward, major ones where we have to close down uh, major arterial streets. I suppose losing Ukrainian Village, I'm going to lose a few of them there in Wicker Park. But, um, you know, last night I was at the Logan Square Neighborhood Association event, uh, their annual congress. Uh, there were a few hundred people there. So in, in terms of the Logan Square area, I'm really, even though I've been in that area for a long time, I've known it, um, you don't know it in the same way that you do when you become an alderman of an area um, because you're really much more closely connected with people. Um, so that area I can't really say, but, uh, you know, in some of our other neighborhoods, Roscoe Village, uh, Wicker Park, um, you know, Hamlin Park. We, we have a lot of events uh, based around the different holidays. Um, we work closely with our neighborhood organizations and with the park advisory councils, which are just made up of parents and, and family members in the neighborhoods. And I think if you look at the Ward 32 website, you can go on there, ward32.org, uh, go to the uh, neighborhood pages, or if you get on my newsletter, um, you can click, uh, go on ward32.org. There's a, a place where you can go sign up for the newsletter, and every week I send out a newsletter, as Steve mentioned, about the different issues, but we also put all of the events that we know about or can get onto the newsletter, and it's pretty extensive. You can find out about all sorts of family events there and things that I support. And um, one of the things I pointed out with your two maps is that you still maintain Bucktown on the new map. I know yeah. that one of the strong organizations in Bucktown is the Bucktown Community Organization. So I know they and definitely, better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they definitely try to sponsor a lot of uh, community community related things. Um, let me ask you real quick. Um, let's talk about the parking meters now. When when you came in today, you told me a bit about what it was like today, sitting in a meeting discussing what the new parking meter deal looks like. Can you give any insight into exactly what? what you're facing in city council voting on this well uh we're not facing the same uh three-day rush that we saw back in 2008 when the city sold off the parking meters to abu dhabi and morgan stanley um it turned out to be the worst privatization deal in this century and i can i can just attest to that having gone through the last few years of trying to deal with this parking meter issue and i think everybody out there would agree um, we potentially lost billions of dollars, billions of dollars that could have gone into all these other policies and things that we need to fix the city, whether it's new, uh, more police officers out on the street to fight the overwhelming crime that we're seeing, um, not, you know, stop from closing mental health clinics, whatever. But today we had another briefing about the Ma Mayor Rahm Emanuel's new deal um, where he's trying to, he said, make uh, lemonade out of lemons, but uh, it's pretty sour stuff. And... Um, it's not all it's cracked up to be. So I think a lot of us will be, uh, you know, looking at a no vote uh, starting from that perspective instead of starting out with an automatic yes, even though, as we talked, uh, 24 of my colleagues already signed on to uh, Mayor Emanuel's deal. So it's it's pretty sketchy, but um, it just it's more bad news for taxpayers in the city and just everyday residents and businesses. Well, yeah, yeah I was mostly referring to the, um, the rubber stamp uh, 
uh, report that came out, and, and since a lot of people already, a lot of the aldermen already said they were going to sign on to it without reading the finer details, <laughs> it, it was interesting to hear some of the finer details today because um, it seems like something that you actually not only have to sit in a meeting on, but almost take like a, uh, a collegiate course in, on how, how to understand the math and the ratios behind how it's being distributed. It is, and I actually I'm uh, blessed to have uh, people who are very close to me that have been helping out, uh, taking a lot of their time out of their uh, daily schedule and their evenings, and we've been sitting down for the last few weeks now running through numbers, different analysis, um, different perspectives on it. You know, when somebody tells you uh, uh, we're going to have something for free, especially when it comes to meters, <laughs> uh, you got to question everything that they say. So when the mayor said, hey, it's going to have uh, free Sunday parking, uh, nothing's for free. So um, the cost that we've found on it is going to be much more uh, costly than, than free. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to the, the phones here. Hello, caller. What's your question? Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I had a question. Um, it's, it's regarding disabled parking. I'm just curious. If you live in a in a in a residency where there's disabled per parking and the person moves out of that unit, um, does that parking spot become available? Good question. Is that a well? If it's a private parking spot, um, that would be up to the building management or the condo association, depending on what you have. Uh, you know, if it's a rental building, I'm not really sure. But um, if it's a public space, uh, what we try to do is uh, make sure that we follow up on a yearly basis or as much as we can to find out what that person with that handicap spot is doing. That's if it's a public space. If it's a public space you can, uh, and you question it, you can write into our office, you can email us or call us. And, and what we do is we just ask the Department of Transportation and uh, their inspectors to go out and just follow up to make sure that that person is still up to date on their handicapped parking space. Yeah, sometimes there's a, um, a reference number on the sign itself, and That's you, can, correct. you can take that down and call it into the office. That's right. Uh, let's take another call. Hello, caller. What's your question? Uh, yes, a couple of points. Uh, one, I would argue that many of the impasses that we have in the city of Chicago are a direct result of the fact that we have a city council that's made up of 50-some-odd uh, members. As compared to New York, uh, wherein their equivalent council members represent about 161,000 people compared to Chicago's. Uh, in, in Los Angeles, it's about a quarter of a million people for every council member, and there are only 15 members. And this is why in Chicago, it's easy to take a position because you represent such a small constituency. There's so many members, so rather than looking at things at a larger scale, it's easy to say, I don't want a school closed because I have a couple of them in my area, in my aldermanic ward, so I want to save those. And if I represented more people, it might be incumbent upon me to make some of those tough choices. And, and lastly, since 1990, we've lost over 184,000 school-aged children that attended public schools in the city of Chicago. Thanks for those points. And, yeah, the numbers that you're talking about almost represent what a state representative for Illinois would, yeah. would represent as well. Well, I think in the last redistricting, uh, a couple of us offered up a map that we actually based on community areas in Chicago. And uh, we put it forward to basically reduce the number of aldermen to 35 aldermen. Um, Mayor Emanuel wanted 25, but he didn't make a move on it. And when we offered the 35, not a lot of people obviously bid on that. But um, it was the only time that you could put that forward during the redistricting. But I... I agree with you. I think we could lower the number. Um, we were just joking beforehand about if you have, uh, you know, 40 some odd people doing a rubber stamp uh, all the time, what's the point of having that many people? So you could reduce that number and actually get some debate going, you would hope. Um, I, I didn't catch some of the uh, comment that he made. There was, it was a little garbled there, but... Um, Losing kids in the, in the schools okay. since 1990, there are less children in Chicago going into the CPS system. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, when you talk about closing schools, if you had a master plan in place, um, which CPS did not, it was very haphazard the way they undertook this thing. Show me the facts. Uh, show me what's really going on. But uh, there were a lot of news sources out there, WBZ, Sun-Times, a lot of other people did some very intensive work on what was really happening in those schools, and it didn't, uh, it didn't match up to what CPS was saying. So um, when CPS can show us the, the truth and the reality on the ground, then maybe people should accept that, but that's part of the problem. Yeah, also just to mention them, one of the best uh, uh, sources I saw so far was the Raise Your Hand Coalition. Absolutely. Uh, they've yeah. been following that really closely, the, how the ratios work, how the numbers yep. work, how many kids per school. So it's They disproved been, a lot of the facts that uh, were thrown out there by CPS that just didn't match up. Right. 
Um, let me take a second here to talk about just neighborhood crime. Now, uh, a lot of aldermen will focus on crime and safety, obviously, for their yeah. constituents. But you're one of the, uh, well, you know, a lot of aldermen will do a ride along or something like that with the police. But you're very, very committed to focusing on improving the safety of the communities that you represent. And I wanted just to thank you on behalf of all of your constituents because I know firsthand that you do a lot of work yourself and um, it's impressive. Thanks. Yeah, we, uh, and just so everybody knows, uh, Steve started his own neighborhood watch program for uh, Ukrainian Village through Facebook, but it got a lot of people involved, uh, got a lot more eyes out there on the street, you know, people walking to and from work or they're doing their daily, uh, you know, things out there. And we've tried to replicate that in every ward, getting these neighborhood watches out there. And then we spend a lot of time at night um, just, you know, going through the different neighborhoods, working with our officers uh, very late at night, like three, four, five in the morning, yep. which uh, can be a drag sometimes, but that's, um, it's been very beneficial, I think, overall. All right, we're going to go back to the phones here. Uh, hello, caller, what's your question? Hey, this is Fred from Bucktown. I have a question for the Altman. Okay. Um, with the mayor consistently saying how broke the city is, and how he cannot possibly afford more police. Uh, how incensed are you that he wants to drop a hundred million for DePaul, uh, or he wants to drop forty million on boat houses? Uh, what do you go through when you hear stuff like that? It's a good question. Um, you know, with the with the DePaul issue, uh, well, go back a, a couple weeks ago. A lot of the retirees in the city were told that they have to go and, and get their own health care or go get on to Obamacare, and they were kind of thrown that uh, at the last second without any notice. It came out in a, in a news article in the Sun-Times instead of being sent a letter or, or having that type of discussion. And then the next day they were throwing the DePaul uh, arena out there with, uh, you know, 100-plus million dollars in TIF money being spent. Um, that DePaul issue, you know, it, it has to do, I think, with um, rebuilding an area that doesn't perhaps need that money, um, has to do with the possibility of putting a s casino down there. There's a lot more to it than just uh, the DePaul arena, but um, when I see that we're lacking police officers out there, not just in my neighborhoods um, for the 32nd Ward, but at the surrounding areas, um, we know that there's been diminished numbers, um, and we try to make that up but with, you know, neighborhood involvement, but we can't, and um, I think it is pretty outrageous when you hear a superintendent sit there and say we, uh, you know, throw around different numbers at every budget session uh, that just don't add up and won't answer a lot of the questions. And that's the frustrating part of, of government here. Um, people are too apologetic for all the corruption and waste and mismanagement that goes on. And, it, and that to me, that needs to stop. Well, we're almost in our last minute here, so I'm not sure if we can get to any more questions. But I want to put your information up here real quick again. And um, just remind people that they can get updates on your website, not only about neighborhood events, but infrastructure projects and whatnot. Um, right. And also you have a newsletter. Yeah, and if you want to sign in for that, uh, we do all of uh, all the updates about stuff in the war, but we also try to talk about the citywide issues in that newsletter as often as possible, uh, things that happen at the city council, and uh, try to answer as many emails as we can. All right, let me put your info up one more time. So the phone number to the office is 773-248-1330, and the website is ward32.org. Do you have any uh, final final comments for the audience here before we go off the air? Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, people should um, read up as, as much as they can on the different issues here in the city. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to get involved, um, not only politically, but just in different schools, in your community organizations. And we have so many in the 32nd Ward, but I would say just look around and, and see which community groups are out there and, and you know, go to your Facebook and, and look up, you know, Steve on Ukrainian Village. <laughs> um, that might be one way to get involved and, and just start going to these different meetings and discussing what's happening in your neighborhood and become part of the community. Well, thank you, Alderman. Uh, again, I'm Steve Nikotopoulos, staff member here at TV. Today we were joined by Alderman Scott Wagesbeck. Thank you, sir, for taking the time to come down. You bet. Thanks for having me. And thanks to Sylvia on phones here. Uh, be sure to tune in next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for the next edition of Political Forum here on CAN-TV.